There's been a lot of discussion about India's growth story and the increasing divide between the organized and unorganized sector. We take a deep dive into these issues with none other than Kaushik Basu. In conversation with our global business editor, Udayan Mukherjee. The countdown to Budget 2022 has begun and it's a good time to examine the state of the post-COVID Indian economy and what the government needs to do to stimulate the economy, particularly uh, the lower end of the pyramid. My first guest in this series today it has a very unique global and local perspective because not only is he a distinguished professor of economics at Cornell University and a former chief economist of the World Bank, but he was also chief economist of the government of India, chief economic advisor of the government of India uh, back in 2009. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Koshik Basu to this show. Koshik, uh, wonderful to have you on the show and a very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Udan. My pleasure to be talking to you. Thank you. Uh, well, as I said, I mean, uh, a good starting point for the series would be to examine where the Indian economy is today post-COVID. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, the assessment of it differs depending on who you are. Some think it's a robust and sustainable recovery. Some believe it's quite fragile. Uh, what do you think? I mean, is it, is it a strong rebound or do you think it's an uneven one, even bordering on fragile? Udayon C, the rebound is pretty strong. 9.2 percent but so it's not the fragility of it what is important to understand is that india had dropped down quite a bit 7.3 percent was the negative growth last year so a large part of the sharp growth and it is a genuine sharp growth is from that bottom of the pit so what is worrying is the following india dropped more than most other countries uh, the the pandemic management probably caused it. The pandemic was there. So all over the world, GDPs were dropping. India's dropped more than in other countries, perhaps to do with the management. We will come back to those details. Now, if you take the bounce back and then flatten it over two years, with the government of India data, India's GDP growth over two years has been 0.6% per annum. India's population is growing at roughly 1.2% per annum or 1.1% per annum, which means once you put these two together, India's GDP per capita is actually shrinking over the last two years. The average growth is about minus 0.5%, a tiny shrinkage taking place. On top of that, and this is all not fragility, but the nature of the growth the top end of India is doing pretty well. All kinds of data coming out from Oxfam, even Government of India data, if you look carefully, if you're reasonably well off in India, you're not doing badly at all. But the bottom segment is doing badly from all accounts. So where the problem lies is that if you're in the bottom half of India, the modern terminology of this is a K-shaped recovery. The top end is going up, the bottom is coming down. That in India is very, very marked. So overall growth for the per capita GDP is slightly negative over two years, government of India data. Bottom doing worse than the top, which is growing. The top is actually becoming better off per capita, which means for the bottom segment, it is a very difficult situation. And it's not all to do with the pandemic. The pandemic has caused it. But in India, from 2016, Every year's growth has been less than the previous year's growth, which has not happened in India ever since 1947. A five-year run where each year is lower than the previous year. Last mm. year, of course, now it's picking up. But before that, the stretch of five years is each year doing worse. So all this has caused a situation where overall growth, even if it has become sustainable and really India has the strength, we can go back to that. It is a pretty grim situation for the workers, for the farmers, for even the middle classes, because it's a K-shaped recovery, very, very marked. Right. I just want to take you back to those years of 2016 to 19, because you make a very important point that this is not all to do with the pandemic. So if I take you back to that and ask if the downward trajectory of the economic curve, which we were growth curve, which we were experiencing between 2016 till the pandemic struck, a lot of people believe that maybe that we have snapped out of that and this year onwards while 
the growth will actually optically come down once the base effect goes away. We will refine the kind of trajectory that we had pre-2016. Do you agree with that assessment that India can India has actually refound its growth uh, trajectory pre-2016? Or the average growth of the next few years will be no more than 5, 5.5% or 5 to 6%. I don't think we have snapped back out of it. And let me try to explain a little bit. There's one segment you have to remember in India's GDP growth calculation. We calculate our formal sector pretty well. India's statistics are very good. What you do about the informal sector is you take the growth rate of the formal sector, you attribute the same growth rate to the um, uh, um, informal sector. What we do know is that from 2016, the informal sector has been shrinking very rapidly like never before. So some of this attribution, which is done in good faith, and we've done this for a long time, the informal sector being attributed to the informal sector, that is not working. So, and there's another thing happening where I, even if it's a rebound, it's not the kind of story which India was facing. And I should go back right up to say 2003, there were indicators that India was beginning to do well. India's investment rate was picking up then. And as you know, by 2003, seven, eight, India was a global story. It was a question of whether it'll be India in the lead or China. India's nowhere near that scene anymore. We can still get there because India has fundamental strength, but let me point to one thing which has happened and it's probably contributing to this overall, not quite back there scenario. Investment as a part of GDP. Uh, if you look at the total amount of the GDP that is being invested, India was climbing from 2003, India began to improve. By 2008, 39% of India's GDP was investment. And that was up to 2011, 2011, 12, I remember the number. Again, 39% of GDP is investment. India is beginning to look like an East Asian economy and the global conversation on India is extremely buoyant. Where is investment, which was at 39%, it's now at 32%. And this is not a stock market indicator which fluctuates. 39 to 32 is a pretty steady downward journey. Investment is the central force of an economy's growth. We've done poorly on that. So yes, we will bounce back reasonably. India has enough strength. But right now, there is no reason to believe that we are going to get where the story was really a very, very positive story on India. We are not seeing signs of that as yet, unfortunately. Mm. You also spoke about the K-shaped recovery. Now, I want to ask you, I mean, if you were sitting in the finance minister chair, there are two ways to look at it. One is to look at what is going on with corporate earnings, corporate growth, because the organized sector is clearly gaining at the expense of the unorganized sector. The formal economy, in your words, is growing at the expense of the informal economy. Uh, partly by design, uh, it seems. Uh, but is that an acceptable trade-off in a country like India in your eyes? Or in the finance minister's chair, you would worry more about what's happening with the micro and small medium, small medium enterprises, what's happening with the informal end of it? Because in sheer numbers, that's a very, very large number of people. What can you do to alleviate that, that problem? Yes, so it's part of it maybe by design, but in that case, the design is wrong. And this needs to be understood because it is true, it's good to have the organized sector growing. And India is doing somewhat better in the organized sector. But it is not the case that the unorganized sector labor is being absorbed here. This is a relatively capital intensive sector, the organized sector. And all the data that we are getting on unemployment situation indicates that this sector is not being absorbed. The organized sector is growing, but the unorganized sector is not being absorbed here. It's being left to mind its own business. And if you look at unemployment, really, this is something that I want to stress because I do want the people who are taking decisions now to begin to pay attention to this. India's youth unemployment is 24%. Just to give you a sense of comparison, for Bangladesh, it is 12%. For Malaysia, it is 11%. India, 24%. This is not where India was meant to be. India has always done worse than other countries in terms of youth unemployment. I don't want to exaggerate that, 
but it steadily worsened and now at 24%. If you look at overall unemployment, latest government data is 7.9%. It had to be higher. All over the world, unemployment has risen. But 7.9% Bangladesh after the rise is at 5.6%. So our workers are not being absorbed. And this is a matter of concern. And it's the infrastructure investment which can employ them. Let me give you one which is people will make it out to be a political topic, but it's not a political topic. The kinds of things that we should do. Investment to absorb labor is important. But right now, since there is inflation, the investment ought to be in productive investment. One which does jar me, I have to say, the central Vista project in the middle of this situation. And I'm not talking about whether it is worthwhile or not. That's another debate. And a project like this, if the economy is in a buoyant state, you want to do it. But right now, when there is so much of suffering among the working classes, this project, I think, is wrong. It's about $2 billion over four years. This money could have been spent on other things. And over here, it will be pointed out that it's creating employment. And it is true. There are estimates that something like 10,000 people are being employed. But see, this, this is why economics is fascinating and difficult. It intertwines with Keynesian policy. Keynes would say that you during a depression, just create jobs, do anything. And to that extent, this may look fine. You're creating jobs. But this is not the usual Keynesian depression. This is a recession coming with inflation. So if you employ people and give them money, but not produce worthwhile goods, then it's going to fuel inflation. So for that reason, the expenditure right now ought to be entirely focused. I would say for Nirmala Sitaraman right now, the aim should be focus it all on productive investment where more output comes out. Because otherwise, if you just create jobs and have unproductive investment, you're going to fuel the inflation which is already high. So it is a policy to counter the recession, but not a Keynesian recession where there is deflation. We currently have a recession with inflation, and that leads to subtle differences in policy making, which government of India has enough expertise for people to work this out and take this forward. What is the extent of support you think is required for the lower end of the pyramid that you alluded to? Uh, do you think there, sh there should be substantial government investment in some kind of a growth stimulus? Uh, because the trade-off is, what should one do with the fiscal deficit? I mean, that's what the budget is about for, at the end of the day. Because we've strayed away from the path of fiscal discipline because of COVID. This year is the, since tax, uh, tax revenues have seen quite a bit of buoyancy, the big question for the finance minister is whether to get back to the path of fiscal discipline or to give it one more year of elbow room and to try and use this money uh, for some kind of a growth stimulus. If you were in her shoes, what would you choose? Uh, what would you opt for? Yeah, Udo and see, um, the revenue part has improved and that the government deserves credit. It's improving. The GST collection has improved. So there is money in hand. What I would do at this point of time, however, is I would not rush for fiscal discipline simply because the employment situation for the worse off people, for the farmers, for the workers, for small businesses across the board, it's a very, very difficult time. Barring the people who are at the top end for India, it's a very difficult time. So what should the finance ministry do? Right now, don't go gung-ho on controlling fiscal deficit. Let the fiscal deficit, yes, you can't let it go crazy. It'll be difficult to manage, but don't be overzealous about cutting down fiscal deficit. The inflation control, which is the fear if your fiscal deficit is large, leave it largely to the central bank. Reserve Bank of India in India, fortunately, is a very professional body. Leave them with the task of inflation management. You worry about creating jobs. So what you need to do is a large part of this expenditure, the deficit will be still moderately high, but the expenditure has to be flawlessly on productive employment creation. For that, part of it is the direct responsibility of the government. But a part of it is also the government should support and help small businesses, the private sector, but the small private sector, who will then create the jobs where these workers will be pulled in. 
With all this, there is one more thing I, I may point out is just like infrastructure. Infrastructure, by the way, India has not done too badly. The infrastructural investment has picked up a little bit, but there are two bedrocks for the market economy. The infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, there is some improvement over there, but there is something else, which is economists don't often talk about, though nowadays modern economists have begun talking about. Trust in society is a very invisible kind of trait, but it makes a difference. There are cross-country studies showing that the Scandinavian countries do well because they have trust among themselves higher than in other countries. This has nothing to do with a race or a region because East Asian countries now have trust levels comparable to Scandinavian countries and do well. India, there has been a trust erosion and there are informal studies showing that trust has gone down, society has become polarized. I don't know who is to blame, but it is for the government to try to pull it all in together and develop trust because investment depends on many things, but one of them is trust. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to quantify, though there are studies from Israel. There are beautiful studies in laboratory. If you have a group that trusts one another playing a game, that group begins to become richer. The group that trusts one another and a group that does not trust one another becomes poorer. And these are controlled lab experiments extremely important. So overall, and this is, I'm not saying that this is Nirmala Sitaraman's job because this is a larger task for the government. The government has to pay attention to that. What she has to pay attention right now is don't worry excessively about the fiscal deficit. Let it be a bit higher for a while. Let the uh, Reserve Bank of India do the inflation control, but make your expenditure entirely focused on productive jobs, job creation, so that output is growing you're not just creating jobs with no output, which is going to fuel inflation, which is also at a very dangerous point in India. The other thing which uh, she would be weighing uh, in terms of options, Kaushik, is uh, this whole thing between investment and consumption stimulation. Because there is one school of thought which is saying that uh, since incomes have suffered so much at the lower end of the spectrum, there needs to be some kind of consumption support, which, I mean, through any means, some direct benefit transport, taxation policy, etc. Do you think some of our focus should lie with uh, towards consumption or would you say 100% towards investment and job creation? No, quite a bit towards consumption you can't avoid because I feel we are underestimating the suffering of the bottom half of India. All piecemeal data coming in shows that, and there are some global studies now, which are showing that poverty in India is increasing more than in other parts. So India's overall growth is hiding the fact that the bottom segment is doing very, very poorly, not to be taken lightly. For that reason, you have to directly support the poor with money, but also with support which makes the small private sector, the small businesses begin to grow once again so that they absorb some of the labor. Everything can't be done by the government absorbing the labor. So that's the way in, her, in which her expenditure ought to be. Support some consumption right now. The suffering is far too great not to do that. But yes, also pay, begin to pay attention to production. What you must not do is expenditure, where you create jobs and there is no production meant for consumption. Because that is right now, at this point of time, it is a glaring mistake to do that. It is globally visible. It's embarrassing to spend money on things which are not producing consumables, where there is so much suffering right now that is taking place. Let me spend a minute on government's resource mobilization, Koshik. Uh, uh, because while there has been some buoyancy in tax revenues, the government has not done very well on raising any kind of capital revenues through areas like disinvestment or public sector enterprises. But of course, recently there's been a grand announcement of a very aggressive uh, asset monetization plan of assets owned by the government of India. But, and uh, how important is it that the government gets uh, aggressive and actually becomes competent in uh, selling some of these assets because uh, the government's debt to GDP is approaching 90%. I mean, very soon we will need, be needing to raise considerable resources to be able to spend along the lines that you are, uh, you are speaking about. See, the debt to GDP ratio, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, the conventional view was that you're comfortable if it is around 60%. You don't want it to go much higher than that. And for a long time, India was used to so 
inching towards 70 percent. 90 percent is actually very, very dangerous. And this is dangerous for the following reason that with debt to GDP ratio for a, it's something that happens under the carpet. You don't feel it in everyday life. But when things begin to go wrong, and we've seen this happen even in European countries, when debt to GDP ratio is high and things begin to go wrong, it unwinds very, very rapidly. The, for the government the, to bring in money and some of its government's excessive useless assets to be sold is a good idea. But this has to be done arm's length. It has to be a very, very professional body that is brought in. And you're not fueling crony capitalism by selling it all to a few big businesses. India mercifully, unlike for instance, historically growing up used to hear in Pakistan about 22 families owning everything. India mercy, mercifully was not like that. We don't want to get into that where everything is being sold to a few big companies. So this has to be done very, very professionally. And there is no getting away from the fact that the government also plays a big role. You know, my own view, if I may give you my broad ideological view, is that in countries, governments ought to be small, but there has to be taxation of the top income and transfer of money to the bottom. So the government's role should be a quick transfer and then don't get into every activity trying to manage and run every activity. Do keep a cap on the highest income and the bottom income, but don't get involved in that. And monetization of some of this can be done in exactly in that spirit. We want to be small, but we want to affect a transfer from the rich to the poor, because once again, India's inequality is an unacceptable level of inequality that we are seeing in India today. This needs to be corrected. And in the name of monetization, we must not fuel the inequality by making the rich richer and the poor poorer. You just alluded, Koshik, to uh, uh, inflation being at precarious levels or dangerous levels. Uh, now, you're sitting in New York, where over the last few days and last few weeks, all the debate has been just around this subject, whether inflation has got ahead of, uh, ahead of the Fed, whether interest rates will now start running very high and will be raised very quickly, quicker than earlier envisaged. And that will lead to unraveling of asset prices which have been fueled by easy money over the last few years. Uh, where does the world stand with regard to inflation in your eyes? Because it's not just a problem in the Western world, it's increasingly looking like a problem in India as well. Right. And you're right again that inflation is also not India specific. It's a bit of a global problem happening everywhere. In the US, it's quite high. Here is one difference which we have to keep in mind. If it becomes a global problem, each country will have to handle in its own way. One thing about the United States where inflation is the big debate now. In the US also, as you know, there is a big segment of the population which is quite poor. And for them, the rise in price hurts a lot. The only good thing about the nature of the US inflation is it happened because money was being pumped into the hands of the people during the COVID at its peak. So there was a variety of support that the Biden administration gave directly to people. I mean, I know a whole lot of people out there running little shops and all who are getting money being given by the government. So the inflation is high, It has been, but it has been caused by money in the hands of the segment that needed it most. So there is a cushion for the poorest segment. That's not the nature in which the Indian inflation is coming. So you have to be careful that the, if the inflation picks up, what is going to happen to the bottom segment which is going to be decimated. That's a worry in the United uh, States, but it comes from there. One more thing I'll point out because I was in government when inflation was higher than what it's now in India. So inflation had gone up to about 10%, very, very high inflation. But again, the same thing needs to be remembered. At that point of time, India's real GDP growth, per capita GDP growth was about 8% real GDP growth. So people were becoming better off each year by about 7%, 8% per annum average person. Inflation is at 10%, but your real income is increasing. Buying power is eroding, but the real, it's not taking away from the real, uh, real income increase, which is real. Now it is coming on a slightly negative growth. So your real income is shrinking and you're getting this inflation of 5% or whatever it is right now. So it is hurting much more than when your real consumption grows by seven, 8%, which is what was happening there. 
in the youth. So there are differences across countries. We have to take these very differently and plan for this. And my feeling once again is in India, we've got an extremely able Reserve Bank of India. So a lot of the inflation management has to be passed on to the Reserve Bank of India and give them the space to do that. But the fiscal policy has to be focused on the poorest segment and nothing else at this point of time. Wonderful hearing your thoughts, Koshik, as always. Thank you very much for your time today uh, and for spending us so much time explaining what the finance minister's priorities uh, should be. But great talking to you.